Welcome back to another exciting episode of Cyber Defense TV. I'm your host, Gary Malefsky, and I am the publisher of Cyber Defense Magazine. Sitting in my hot seat today is someone who I am very happy to see again. I think you came over the pond to visit us. It's Pim Tolls. He is the founder and CEO of Intrinsic ID, a very cool and important company when we're talking supply chain management and the development of hardware. Correct. So Intrinsic ID, intrinsically, we produce things that all are slightly off. Exactly. That's not exactly the goal, of course, but that's what happens in reality. So if you were um, Nokia and you're making Windows smartphones, I'm kidding because they stopped, but I want them. They were good phones. But let's say you're uh, Samsung, you're making a lot of phones, you get a Qualcomm chip in the phone, and we, we build a ton of phones, and I want to spoof your MAC address and call my friend or call the office and play your voice saying, send Gary the money, right? They're, they're doing these things called uh, uh, voice voice attacks. I forget that. Uh, there's a name. Instead of spam, it's yep. VAM. I don't know, whatever <laughs> it is. There's a voice attack over the phone. They're doing uh, deep fakes now where it's yes, a visual exactly. of you. Yep. How do I get my hardware to be my hardware and to be me? Yeah, so that starts really by uh, looking at the hardware itself, first of all. And luckily, in a certain sense, all hardware is slightly different. Even all chips are slightly different. Even if they come out of the same fab with ISO 9001 quality controls. Absolutely. And the, the ultraviolet lights and the... Everything, everything the same. Yeah, full environment, full production chain the same. Let's say we look at chips on the same wafer even. So they have all... The same functionality, logically they are completely equivalent, but if you would start looking with a microscope, you would see that, physically speaking, they are slightly different. Okay, Nikola Tesla, how did you figure this out? Well, it is, it is a, such a phenomenon that is uh, uh, known for a long time. What's the phenomenon called? The phenomenon is called the deep submicron process variations. Deep submicron process variations, exactly. DSPV, a new acronym. Yay, I can add one more to my book of a thousand cybersecurity acronyms. DSPV, deep submicron, submicron process, process variations. variations. And how long has this been known? Oh, for, for, for tens of years. This really? Is known. really? Yeah. But nobody uh, uh, realized this, how you could use this and whether there is a use to this. And in particular, how you could use this for um, security purposes. So tell us how you use this for security purposes. So... The fact that they are all slightly different, physically speaking, means also that you have a way to recognize them. Because if you can see the difference in the physics, then you have a way to distinguish one from the other. You know what this scares me about? When we claim we can do teleporters and teleport humans from one place to another, there will be variations. The end resulting person the first few times is going to come out with parts <laughs> missing at the, at the deep subliminal micron. I mean, really, you, everything, no, it, there's no perfection. No, so, you, and so here we are talking manufacturing. What you're talking about is quantum teleportation. That's yeah, a, I know. I'm going in the future. Topic. That's too far but, away. Uh, in, in the production, you cannot fully control all your processes. For instance, when you uh, lay down transistors on the silicon, uh, you have to dope the silicon with ions. And you cannot exactly control where the ions end up. You cannot exactly control how many ions there will be in a, in a certain spot. Because of and the so, size. It's a size issue. Just be, oh, no, in it's air, also it's just, there's so many issues. Just travel through the silicon. Yeah, and sometimes so there could they be hit something here and they something. hit something there. Got and it. then they stop at a certain uh, depth. But you don't know. You don't have exact control. Impurity of metals and other things. Exactly. Magnetics. Exactly. Electromagnetic. You have yeah. all those things. So many variables. Indeed. Uh, and, and you see that at the microscopic level even, because all transistors on a chip have a slightly different threshold voltage. All those threshold voltages are close to each other, otherwise the chip would not work. The threshold know? voltage, for example, you, you buy the wrong power supply from China by accident, at the wrong store, and it says this will always work with iPhones. You plug it in, and your iPhone doesn't work because they, they, their threshold was off. And you plugged it in 110, and they didn't they didn't have the right capacitor or something. I don't know well, exactly, but the point yeah, is that's a mistake. Yeah, there, there are these small, let's say, again, variations mm -hmm. through which all these threshold voltages are slightly off. They're close. All transistors will work normally. Normally. Yeah, within the, the specs of the chip. But... Uh, if you look a bit closer, you will see that they're all slightly different. Okay. And now you will probably say, oh, 
I understand what those guys do. They have figured out a way to read out all those threshold voltages. So you read out the threshold voltages and you create a fingerprint that's unique for every single chip. No. No, <laughs> I love it. Even better. No, you, because, had, you had me at no. Yeah. Okay. No, the reason is that threshold voltages are very, very sensitive to variations in temperature. Because it'll change the next reading. Exactly. Oh, you tricked me. That was brilliant. So what you do is you look at a phenomenon that depends on the difference of threshold voltages. Because if then they all change due to temperature, they will all become, let's say, in the same amount bigger or smaller, but the difference will stay the same. So it's the differential. It's a differential measurement. And that's I love a, it. a typical thing you always do if you want to remove noise. So where does that happen on a chip? When did you think of this? Long time ago. This is brilliant. Yeah. Were you drinking Belgian ale and one day said, aha, I have an epiphany? Something like that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> dark, Bel dark Belgian beer. Dark Belgian beer. I have an epiphany. And how, I mean, how can you use this for cybersecurity? Let me explain a little bit further. So if an SRAM comes up, due to these variations in the threshold voltages, all the cells in the SRAM will have their logical preference state, either mm. logical one or logical zero. Mm -hmm. So right after startup, in the SRAM, you have a long string of zeros and ones. Mm -hmm. And if you would look to at the values right after startup in an SRAM line next to it, mm -hmm. you will see that more or less half of the positions are different, which means this is unique for the SRAM. This means you can start using it as a way to um, distinguish between one SRAM and the other. Internet of Things microcontrollers, what are they going to use this data for to ensure it's really the same device? Supply chain management issues? It uh, is supply chain management. It is indeed recognizing that counterfeit. it is your device, that it is not being counterfeit. Nothing counterfeit. That the software is properly protected, that the software is encrypted and cannot be reverse engineered. Whoa, whoa, whoa. How do you protect the software that has been encrypted and not reverse? Because you have a crypto chip that you've done this to, and you have the intrinsic ID of the crypto chip, and you, you've got the key management and the process yeah, so of encryption. So what we offer to our customers is that mm. they embed this technology together with crypto functionality around so it. You so you give them an SDK. Can we give them an SDK? Software developer kit or API, application program or interface. Very good. It's the, it's the, it's the acronym year, yeah. the year of the acronym. You learned a lot. Too many. <laughs> so This I, is great. Yeah, we give them that functionality. And with that functionality, they can then allow their customers to encrypt the software and store it in an encrypted way on the chip. Love it. And now it comes. Okay. You could say, well, I can still steal the encrypted software. But if you steal the encrypted software and put it on another chip... You don't have the chip with the same... So exactly. you have made... Oh, my gosh, I just figured you out. You have taken the MAC address down to the mi micron level. You're, exactly. the, you're the micron MAC address man. Something like that, yeah. Because the MAC address is supposed to be unique, but we're going to run out soon. No, exactly. And MAC addresses, uh, it's, it's well known how they get spoofed. But you can't but, spoof what you're doing. Exactly. That's, that's un the unless way. you're the creator of the universe and you said, poof, it's going to always look the same. And that would be quantum mechanics. Exactly. This vibrates over here the same way this vibrates over here. Yeah. The chances of that happening are near zero, probably 0. 0.00000 pi yeah. to the zero one. Something like that. Yeah. That means yeah. you have invented the unspoofable. See, I figured this out now because I need to tell our readers, viewers, listeners that when you call them, they'll be like, I know that guy. Yeah. He's got the unspoofable microscopic MAC address. That's how you can describe it. The unspoofable microscopic MAC address, yeah. which means we can protect any hardware and any software with intrinsic ID. Exactly. I think we should end the interview, get people to visit your site, except for one thing. Who do we want to buy the unspoofable microscopic MAC address technology? From you, who do we want to buy it? Well, the the major semiconductor companies and the OEMs that make uh, devices for the Internet of Things. Internet of Things device makers. Exactly. Semiconductor. What about car manufacturers, or would it be the parts? Well, I, 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 the supply chain I, folks who are doing put an IP address in a car and making it, you know, control the steering wheel. I don't want it remotely hacked. Yeah. So you could say, it, it, well, in in the modern view, you could say cars is probably the first. A large-scale example of Internet of Things devices. Yes. Yeah, there are many currently already a few hundred microcontrollers in a car. The cars are being connected. They will be self-driving. So, yes, this is something for car manufacturers to put our software on their devices and make sure that they get, a, let's say, a global identity for the cars so that they can recognize whether everything is authentic or not. Oh, I've got to make some introductions for you. And, Thank you. Uh, wow. That would be nice. Let me just say this. 
if you have seen a lot of cybersecurity companies, you haven't seen one like Intrinsic ID. Phenomenal. Thinking a little bit ahead of the curve, thinking out into the future, but he's got it working today. He's got a team of 35 people, 170 million chips already, uh, device chips using it, and uh, one trillion to go. Yeah. www.intrinsicid.com. What a phenomenal interview. And then come back next time for an exciting episode of Cyber Defense TV. Mm-hmm.